Hello and welcome back to IT Web TV at the Security Summit 2024. Um, I'm joined by Carissa Varma, who is the Managing Executive for Cybersecurity at Vodacom and President of the Women in Cybersecurity South Africa. And Carissa, welcome. Thank you, Adrian. It's lovely to be here. Cool. It's a pleasure. I know you were here last year. Have you noticed any differences between this year and last year? Um, I think the, the content for me and the, um, the keynotes are always great. Mm -hmm. um, this morning's keynote um, spoke about AI and really just the future, which I thought was really um, a, a good start to the event. So oh. um, really you know, looking forward and looking at trends and things like that. Um, so I always really enjoy the, the first sort of part of the event. And uh, it was the same this year. So that good. consistency is good. It's good. Um, and I think... Um, the 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 nice thing for me always coming to the summit is seeing friends that I haven't seen for a long time and the conversations that happened around copy and um, but so that says stay consistent as well so well done to you guys for attracting uh, all the leaders into one place so we can actually meet up with each other. I wasn't meant to be a leading question but I think I've maybe prompted a little. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, okay, so let's start with um, just like a. An easy question, hopefully. Um, if you can just give me an overview of what your areas of focus are at Vodacom. Because I'm, I'm not sure I was necessarily clear if you're managing an executive for cybersecurity. Is that kind of client facing? Is it internal? Is it the networks? What is it specifically? Yeah, so, so my team focuses on um, protecting Vodacom systems okay. and Vodacom customer data. So okay. we are accountable for everything cybersecurity across Vodacom, across Africa, uh, eight different markets, both the traditional telco environment as well as the financial services environment. Okay, um, okay cool. Um, it's obviously an organization like Vodacom. I'm trying to think it was someone that I heard from um, Vodacom in Kenya. And they kind of, it was a few couple of years ago, and they talked about the number of attacks that they get on the network. Yeah. And someone as high profile as Vodacom with the customer data that you have, I mentioned financial services, we meant like there's a lot of, I guess, high value booty there for um, bad actors to yeah. get after. So how much of a target are you and like if you can give us some some statistics or some kind of indication of how often you get attempted attacks um yeah that'd be great so so we receive about um two billion events a day now these are events not incidents wow okay. so these are things that our systems find interesting um uh, of that two billion events um we get about two incidents okay um, and those are typically auto remediated so our systems automatically take action to protect um, the organization. So so you can see this vast amount of attempts against us really coming down to very few successful or even a attempted successful uh, attacks um, that then get water mediated or, or looked at. Um, and there, there typically isn't um, any harm that comes out of those um, type of incidents. Um, so we very rarely have business impacting incidents, luckily. Okay. And then what sort of um, attacks do you face? I mean, not I'm trying to think the some of the people that we've been talking to um, today have talked about social engineering has been like um, and ransomware and phishing. But what sort of attempts are kind of most prevalent to to you and your yeah. um, organization? So because we're 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 both telco and financial services, we see basically everything. Okay. Um, so I mean we have 203 million customers across Africa, um, and our financial services tra um, platforms transact 1.1 billion dollars a day. Wow. So so we are a huge target. I'm sure. Um, and uh, the range of attacks we see is obviously being a telco because we connect everyone. Um, distributed denial of service would be great because you, you could take us down, you could take governments down, you could take um, big corporates down with one you know, big sweep at a telco. Um, so we are seeing an increase in distributed denial of service attacks. Once again, not very service disruptive because our systems protect us against that, but we are seeing an increase in that. Um, we're also seeing the typical stuff, you know, phishing, um, um, a ransomware, all of those things. Um, nothing that has really impacted us from a major perspective, um, but we are seeing we are seeing increases in in that across Africa. Okay, um, and something you said there just kind of triggered a, a thought in my head. Um, how much, or do you get any sense that there's kind of state-sponsored attacks? Is that something you can kind of talk to, or is that something that's maybe a little bit hush hush? Yeah. So I mean, it, well. I, I, the, the statement I can make is that there, there definitely is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that 
um, the scale of it, the impact of it, um, et cetera, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to um, really um, determine that. I think, um, uh, by and large, um, what we're seeing is that um, telcos are increasingly become a target, becoming a target of interest. Um, and so we're seeing it both from a regulatory perspective where governments are understanding that because telcos connect everything, they are so critical to critical infrastructure. Mm-hmm. We connect hospitals, we connect schools, we connect, um, you know, uh, both public and private sector. Uh, um, so we connect everyone. So so really that uh, importance about telcos and uh, focus from uh, both the regulation perspective has increased over time and it's increasing across Africa in different stages in different countries. Um, and I think all governments are starting to realize that protecting your telco operator is critically important um, and to protect against things like espionage and things like that as well. And so I'm not putting words into your mouth, but I, is there like a negotiation? Is there conversations happening with government to kind of not ask for support, but like, are you having those conversations with government to say, we are important to how this country operates? We need some kind of... Yeah, definitely. I mean, we do it across all our markets. We meet with regulators often. Um, we actually do um, upskilling with regulators. So we invite them into Vodacom. Okay. We we show them what we do. We teach them um, you know, how we've managed to manage cyber incidents. So both imparting um, knowledge on uh, the government itself, because they do need help, but also having that um, you know unilateral, uh, bilateral discussions around um, how do we protect um, citizens? How do we protect big corporations? Um, so that happens on a regular basis. Um, and it, it happens much broader than just South Africa. It happens across the fifth coast. Okay. And then, so in the conversation of collaboration, um, there is another operator of a similar sort of size to yourselves, different colour. Yeah. Um, do you, are you kind of collaborating with your counterparts there and kind of sharing instant time? That's been another topic that's come up today. Yeah. It's kind of a need for more collaboration across industries. Yeah. So, so Vodacom actually chairs um, the um, Cyber Security Incident Response Team at Comric. Okay. And Comric is a um, sector-wide telco um, body that manages risk. So Vodacom actually chairs the cyber elements of that. Um, and when Comric was formed a few years ago, it was the first um, entity to be able um, to allow sharing uh, on a, from a cyber perspective between telcos uh, because prior to that it was all you know very proprietary and we couldn't share and there was a lot of boundaries put on us on what we could say to each other um, but Comric has really brought in um, uh, the opportunity to share so we're sharing a lot of threat intelligence um, we're doing a lot of work to try and um, you know when we see something in one telco to react to it and when we see something to be able to share it um, because we understand that we operate as an, as, as a, as a ecosystem. Sure. Um, if we keep Vodacom safe, but another telco is getting compromised, those are customers that are using both networks, people move from one network to the other, and so there's impact to our customers as well, and we really want to be proactive about it. So wherever we can get threat intelligence from and wherever we can share threat intelligence, we do. Okay, okay. So maybe let's kind of look a little bit closer to your, I guess, your team. Um, can you give me kind of a brief overview of the size of the team and... I think the, the one conversation, I spoke to Manaj a couple of weeks ago um, for a video that we did um, in the build-up to Security Summit, and one of the topics he talks about was kind of that, the burnout and the stress and how to kind of manage that. And I think that's perhaps something that when you look at a CISO, you kind of maybe you don't necessarily consider the stress, or you maybe consider the stress of the CISO, but the team as a whole, everyone must be on tenterhooks all the time. But it's also about getting that the vigilance and being able to kind of you don't want to burn them out, yeah. but you need them to kind of not become apathetic to what's going on. And so how do you kind of deal with that? So so the first part of the question, we're about um, 400 in-sourced and outsourced people across Africa, but we form part of a bigger team, which is the Vodafone team, and there's a thousand permanent employees in cybersecurity across the globe with Vodafone. So I think um, we, we have a very unique dynamic where um, when we are in an high-pressurized or intense situation like a 
political incident, I have a pool of resources that's much broader than just a single country to be able to pull on. Okay. And that helps a lot because um, cybersecurity really works in uh, peaks and troughs. You know, you, you get times that are completely intense and completely busy and, um, you know, that's when people are really burning out and especially if you have long incidents that run over multiple weeks, it becomes very intensive. Um, and so really, we use the resources where they lie and we try and capacitate the team. Now, in saying that, it doesn't always take off the full limit of stress because I think my team is um, so so focused and dedicated on the customers that we serve because we understand it's not just, you know, the hospitals and the schools and things that we're connecting. We're connecting parents with their children. You know, it's such a critical job that we have yeah. as part of society. And we feel it and that obligation. We feel it and that weight that, you know, we carry. We really do feel it. Um, so I think my team puts a lot of pressure on themselves. And so we spend a lot of time talking about prioritization. What are we really focusing on? What we're not focusing on? What are we taking off the cards to be able to give people capacity to actually focus on the right things? Um, and I think then something as a cyber industry, we need to talk more about because we feel like every risk that we don't mitigate now leads to you know between business impact we find we find it very difficult to almost take things off the table and unfortunately you have to take things off the table to make sure your people are okay and that you actually succeed in what you want to achieve okay um staying on the kind of the people subject how would you kind of solve the the human firewall issue i mean beyond your kind of your direct reports but to the wider, I guess, employee kind of audience, what are your kind of initiatives or programs to keep people aware of cybersecurity issues and how regularly do you have to do these things? Um, yeah, how much kind of work is involved in that kind of communication and training yeah. awareness? So I think uh, from a human perspective, uh, I think humans would be a huge ally to a cybersecurity program. Um, but humans are imperfect. Sure. And there are going to be points where humans are going to, and I don't want to use the word fail, but they're going to fall prey to a scam or fall prey to something that, um, you know, is going to get them into trouble. So for me, what's really important is a, a couple of things. So the first thing is uh, we make sure that we don't put all the onus on people. We have systems that back that up and we have processes that back that up to try and keep people safe for when they do fail. Um, because it's, like I said, we're all human, we all are going to fail at some point in time. Um, the second thing is that we um, we really uh, encourage reporting and reporting quickly. Okay. Um, and so when you are, if you have clicked on a phishing link or you, you know, you've done something that's incorrect, when you notify the team, you actually get, you get appraised for it because you've now reported quickly and we can take action to protect the rest of the organization. So it's not seen as a, a, a steep approach. It's seen as more carrot and incentive to talk to us. Um, and then the third thing we do is we really make cybersecurity personal. Um, so my team is now, um, in a few weeks' time, we actually have a talk about uh, parenting and cyber and cybersecurity because that's something that's really personal because I would take an interest in it because I'm a mom. And even if I wasn't in cybersecurity, I'd want to know that my children are safe mm-hmm. uh, and so in that that moment when we're teaching you about how to be safe with your children we're planting the seeds about how to, how to be safe in an organization as well Funny. and that's kind of the strategies that we use okay okay um and then another kind of group or stakeholder group is obviously the board um it's one of the conversations that all questions that i've asked to kind of numerous mm-hmm. colleagues of yours um today but how are you kind of dealing with that i mean i'm assuming a tech savvy board at Vodacom is perhaps a bit different from maybe a more established mining organization where it's less about digital technology. But are there kind of, how do you deal with the board and kind of have those conversations? Do you have to simplify it? Or are you able to kind of talk at a more technical level than perhaps some of your colleagues in other industries? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate, Adrian. I've been on two group level boards in my career. And I've always found the board to be a huge enabler of my objectives because the board really wants what's best for the organization they're they're interested in seeing the organization succeed so in essence they're interested in seeing you succeed because you keep the organization safe and i think if you go into conversations with the board with the board with that mindset that they're actually there to enable you to do your job um you know the tone in which you have the conversations uh, tends to change and then i always say to people there's three CSOs in my mind um, that speak to board or three types of CISOs, uh, CISO conversations at boards. The first one is, you know, someone who goes in and says everything's green. It's a good news story and everything's brilliant and, you know, there's, we're untouchable and, you know, I, I always 
get really scared by that type of picture. Yeah. Um, then you've got the second type of picture, which is like really a doomsayer. Um, those are the guys that are like, we're going to get hacked tomorrow. And if you don't do this, you don't give me money. And, you know, it's like the real... Fearmongers. Yeah, and fearmongers, definitely. Um, and, and they cry wolf all the time. Um, and then I think you get the third type of conversation with the board, which is really a balance between date, using data, a balance between what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, and actually what we don't know. Okay. Because there is always an unknown. Um, and uh, I think being clear about those three aspects um, you know, gives you an opportunity to have very honest conversations with the board. Yeah. Um, and it actually educates the board as well. So you don't have to have a deeply technical board to have technical conversations with the board. But you need to educate your board. So you need to take your board along a journey that says, we're here, we're moving here, and this is what this means. And, and in my experience, that's worked quite well. Okay, okay. And then... The last of the kind of people subject, um, skills. I mean, that's a huge issue. Uh, we spoke to Dinesh from ISC Squared this morning um, about skills specifically. But how are you kind of looking at that? I mean, it's that kind of balance of people who are coming out with qualifications but haven't got the experience. And then there's the poaching of skills. There's the brain drain. I mean, it must. it's a global issue, we know. But, like, it must be quite a challenge for you um, to kind of get people and get them to the right level or maintain people and keep them within the organization? Yeah, so we've been really, um, we've been really good. I mean, I've been at Vodacom now almost for three years and we've had zero attrition in our senior leadership team in cybersecurity across the entire group, across Africa. It's a blessing. Um, it doesn't happen everywhere. Sure. Um, but it's allowed us to actually progress on execution instead of continuously hiring because I think we get stuck in this continuously hiring and replacing and then churn yes you can hand over etc but that churn is really damaging towards execution because you need to take it takes a while for that person to get up to speed um, so I think we've got both the churn aspect of people being poached people leaving etc um, but we've managed to sort of navigate that um, some of the strategies that we're using is we are making sure and had a lot of cyber people like chunky, difficult problems to solve. Okay. So if you give them the same problem to solve over and over, they will probably get bored and look for another, another problem. The reason you get into cyber a lot of the times is because you want to solve difficult things. Challenges. You want to accomplish challenges, sure. right? So, so we've been really good about rotating people. So we've rotated people between our markets, between different roles. We've rotated people from non-cyber teams in Vodacom into the cyber team. Okay. Um, and that's really built quite a uh, interesting dynamic where people... And started to pull together. They they now almost like uh, understand both sides of the fence, and they've built a bit of a community. Um, and equally, they 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 want the next challenge, and they want the next, and they trust the business to give them that next challenge. Okay. And that's helped us a little bit. But I'm not saying it's perfect. I mean, we have lost people that we uh, you know have re regrettably lost. Um, but um, but I think you know all in all, we may, we're able to navigate it. Okay. One time. Um, so this is a very kind of broad question. Um, but what do you think are some of the kind of security challenges facing corporate South Africa? I mean, we talked about if, the, if your network went down, if one of your rivals' networks went down, that connectivity issue. I mean, South Africa is very resilient. It's dealt with load shedding for yeah. <laughs> as long as I've been here, which is nearly 15 years. Um, but yeah, what are the, some of the big kind of cybersecurity issues you think that are um, perhaps being over or overlooked here? So I think, um, I mean, Manoj and I spoke about this earlier, about um, cyber poverty. Um, and, and typically in South Africa, um, cyber skills are expensive. Yeah. And so you, you see a lot of the large corporates with some of the best skills. Yeah. And then you have um, smaller entities, government entities that are not able to attract the talent that they need because they just don't have the buying power to be able to buy that talent in. We can. Um, and I think it's a real challenge that we're not focusing on because we're only as strong as our weakest link and we all interoperate with each other. So, I mean, we're dealing with small, medium businesses and they're doing business for us and we're doing business for somebody else. And that chain just connects all of us together. Yeah. And so we really have to get into that supply chain, third party angle to make sure we are uplifting the entire South Africa um, to make sure all our businesses are moving in the right direction. And the only way we get to do that is by creating more skills and so we solve that cyber poverty challenge and skill demand challenge that we have yeah i mean i think that's um so we had um the chair of the information regulator Bantu kakula at i think our governance uh risk and compliance summit not earlier this year maybe march type um and she was talking about that the kind of the need to raise awareness and i think that's probably 
it's not something that's specific to Vodacom. It's not something yeah. specific to IT Web. It's something that, as a community, we've probably all got to deal with. Yeah. Um, it's kind of raising that general awareness that if you're a person on the street and you're looking at your phone or you've got an email address and you've got a credit card linked to your phone, somehow, potentially, you're vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how we go about doing that. And I, I wonder what the note, like, if you've got any thoughts on that. So, I mean, there's a couple of things we're actually doing practically today. So we do something called uh, a cyber clinic, which Vodacom uh, basically brings in um, SMEs, and we train them on cyber security, and then we give them six months of free consultation after that to be able to improve their posture. So I think we need more people looking at that. Um, but we're also looking at, um, uh, like, one of our partners next year is, is looking at how do we make um, SOC services really affordable and they're launching things that uh, will attract you know uh, smaller businesses not necessarily just um, the big companies that can afford things so, yeah. and so I think it's, it's really about corporates of Africa taking a step forward to say we can't solve the problem alone but I can solve a piece of it and I can take a step forward to do it and I'll do what I can within my power to be able to trans, uh, to be able to transfer uh, or change from where we are now to where we need to be um, and I think if each of us do a little bit the little bit will add up and we'll, we'll get to a better place Do you think there's a need for some kind of coordination of that? Yes, definitely. Um, I definitely think so. Uh, it would be that. Uh, I mean, we always point the finger at government. But. Yeah, um, look, I, I, think, I think the sector forums have a good opportunity to do it as well. The Sabrex, the Comrex, um, the CSAs. I think there's all, you know, there's a lot of joint um, manpower from corporate South Africa behind those, those forums. Um, and I think they could actually be a good home to start hosting some of this and driving some of those initiatives as well. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, and then I'm conscious about time, so I'm just going to ask you a last question and honestly not the, the least important question but the president of the women in cybersecurity in South Africa um, we've just done uh, recently a couple of initiatives with Wired for Women and a partnership with that which is encouraging more women into the general IT space but what do you think we can do to encourage more women into cyber specifically? Um, it's, it's so important so first of all let me start off by saying I think cyber security and technology in a whole has been a male dominated industry from the beginning right? Sure. So I think if you think about that base and where we've started we've actually done a lot of good work because we have a lot more females in cyber today than we had 10 years 20 years ago so we're obviously able to attract females into cyber security and for me I think the gap is in role modeling so people in school, people in university need to understand that as a woman, you can have a good, successful career in cybersecurity. And then the second thing is putting structures around these women once they're in cyber to, to support them. I mean, they're mothers, they have children. When you're in an incident at three o'clock in the morning and you also have a young baby, it becomes really complicated to navigate. So I think putting the structures around women to be able to support them to do a role in cybersecurity is really important as well. Okay. Carissa, that's been great. Thank you so much. Um, That's been Carissa Varma, the Managing Executive for Cybersecurity at Vodacom.